Hi, in this video, I'm going to walk you through the setup of garden lights. So I thought I'd show you what it looks like when it's done. So at least you have that in your mind while we go through this uh, step by step. All right, so I did three floodlights or mini floodlights in my garden. And there you can see what it looks like without the floodlight, without the garden lights. And that's with the garden lights installed. And just having another look, you can have a look there. This is the effect, really nice. I just used 10 watt LEDs. All right, so this is what it looks like when it's installed. A very small form factor and uh, robust. And I'm going to show you how I do this step by step. Uh, if you compare it to the kind of DIY ones, you know, the ones you pin into the ground. Well, I haven't had good, very, uh, good experiences with those. They tend to get knocked, they tend to break, and uh, the wires tend to uh, come out. So let's get started with this installation. All right, please remember to consult an electrician before performing any electrical work. In this video, you will see some cables being put under the ground, buried cables. Please note there are standards regulating how you may lay cables in the ground. These standards vary from country to country. Although you see me perform this installation in the video, please use it as a guide only. In order to do this job, I'm going to have to dig a trench around the back here and run something called conduit and wire up three sets of lights. Right, in order to do this job, you'll need your lights. I'm just using these three LED floodlights. These happen to be have a bit of a yellow tinge, quite nice. And they're obviously IP rated and they can be outside in the rain and so, and so forth. But in terms of the electrical aspects, look, each country is different and the different circuit breakers and the rules that have uh, are applicable in those countries. But I'm just going to show you my way of doing it. And you can use the same principles in your country. Now, you'll need these little uh, couplers and you can see these pipes. This is called conduit. So you'll need quite a few pipes of conduit, as you can see here. And you'll see how I use it in the video. And then the joins will be here because because this will be the tap off to the light and then this will be the continuation of the wire which means you will need quite a lot of electrical wire this is a low current application these are only 10 watts each and maybe we'll get to five of these later maybe i'll build onto the project but the point is this is a light cable which is 1.5 millimeter squared can only carry a maximum of 16 amps so that means the circuit breaker would be a maximum of 16 amps all right so this is the cable this is called flat cable and it is solid core in your case you might be doing something different you might be using flexible cable or just abide by your country specific uh, requirements in terms of the rules for your cabling all right so you're just seeing some bends this is a terminal block to join the cables these are the little caps these are the screws these are some more joins these are some saddles to uh, uh, get the cable into the wall if you need it. This is an electrical meter. You do not have to have a deep electrical knowledge to do the job. And I will show you step by step how to go about this job. And there's some glands. All right, I haven't got all the accessories you need, but you will see in the video step by step what to do. And you can work it out yourself. All right, so you want to dig out the trenches. You can just use a shovel. And this is quite a time consuming job. Right, so there you can see the trench being dug. It's not very deep, about 15 centimeters. And uh, this is a dry area. If your area is very wet, then look at uh, at least IP65 uh, joins and uh, junction boxes. Right, so the trenches have been dug. Now it's time to lay the conduit. What you do is you put the conduit in the trench and you lay them out and you mark off the places where you're going to be teeing off remember we're going to be having the lights a little bit to the side and you'll see shortly so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to put all the conduits on in the trench and get ready to cut them put your conduit in uh, it doesn't have to be exact it's uh, it's almost like a guesstimate and then you get ready to uh, thread your wires so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to show you the conduit in the trenches Right, so you can see this is where we're going to put the light somewhere here. You can see there's a coupler and there's the original conduit running at the back. Right, same story here. You can see the original conduit running in the back channel there. And there is the conduit coming here because the light is going to be about here. And the last light is going to be on the tree. So you can see the conduit running over there. Right, now all of these lights have to be wired to somewhere. You can see on the pillar there is a distribution board. So we are wiring the lights into this distribution board which means you need to determine the length 
from here to where your lights are. So I'll show you the uh, the site so you can get an idea. Right, so I'm going to pan the camera and you can see the length that we have to run to get this wire to the garden where the floodlights are going to be in the plants. All right, so the wire is going to run on the side of this LARPA canopy all the way there going right to the side and the place where the flower bed starts is there in the corner. Once again, please note that there are regulations in terms of what wiring you use in wood structures. For example, if it's under thatched roofs and so forth, please note you need to consult with the relevant standards in terms of your wiring in such instances. While in my installation you may see me using a certain wire, please make sure that this is a guide only. You, The responsibility is on you to conform to the various standards. Okay, so the wire is going to come along that pole, down this pillar. You can see I'm going to put the conduit on the wall and there is the flower bed that I had shown you. So we have to run this cable. So what you'll need to do is walk with the cable around this entire site so that you can get the length. Right, now you can see the cable around the site all the way to the point where we're going to work. There's the flower bed where I'm going to have the floodlights in. So what we have to do is we have to hide the cable along the wooden gum poles. There are certain rules about how you lay your cable, so just comply with your local standards. Right, so we are running the cable at the back of these gum poles. Now there are rules about how you run these cables, as I said, so please comply with your local standards. Right, so we are going to run the cable all along the back of this LARPA. It cannot be seen because as you can see, it's out of the eye line. And then when we get to the flower bed, then we're going to put it in the conduit. Right, so these are saddles. Now you can see the different shape of the saddles. If your wire is round, then you'll use a round saddle. And also the color, you can see this is a black one while uh, this is a white one. Now, as I said, uh, we're using the flat. So that's why we use a flat saddle because we're going to hit it into uh, wood. And you can hit this into a wall. Just remember there are different rules about which cables you can use. This is suffix cable and this has an earth foil around the live neutral and the earth. Which means that if someone had to uh, screw a screw through it, they would not get electrocuted because the earth is around the cable. So this is a safer cable, but as I said, it really depends on your local standards. Right, so there is the saddle holding the cable out of the eye line. Nobody can see this. All right, so this is the last pillar here and the wire is going to come all the way down from the canopy of this LARPA and I'm going to put it in a conduit on the side of this pillar which means that this, this uh, conduit needs to be drilled into the pillar meaning that I'll have to use some clamps so that's what you'll see me doing now I'm going to measure it and then I'm going to cut the conduit to the length that I've measured and then I'm going to use clamps and install it onto the pillar. Right, so you can see the wire is here ready to go into this conduit, but it's at this point that you'll have to do a final measure of the wire because you'll most probably need to cut it. Right, so we've run the wire on the ground, uh, we've measured it out. If you've got a short piece of wire, you won't have to do this, but because we're using a roll, we have to cut it now because we won't be able to thread it through the conduit if you don't cut it. So we worked out the longest point and now we cut it. Right, so starting from your very first conduit, going to thread it through here. This is the one that goes on the pillar on the back. Right, so now this wire is going to continue and go all the way into the trench over here. So now you've got to decide, are you going to use something like that? That looks fine, it could work. Uh, some people find it easier to just use something called spray. So you join it there and then because it's uneven, it's not flat here. It's going to go there, down, and into this first conduit. I'm going to just use sprag. So what I'm doing is I'm just measuring it out from about there to about there. So I'm just going to cut this. Now you'll need these little joints. Right, so there you can see I've put that there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the wire once through everything. 
so that it's uh, the wire is short and I don't have to work with a long piece of wire. So I'm now going to take this out of the bed and I'm going to thread it through this conduit at the same time. Right. So there's the join. That goes into the sprag. Then this is going to go into the first conduit that is going to be running along the wall. I've measured it. Now what we do is we pull from this side the entire cable until this uh, first conduit is uh, aligned on the back of the pillar. You'll see in a moment. Ooh, yeah. Now, one of the reasons why I use the sprag is because if I do need to pull that a bit or, or extend it this way, the sprag is loose, it can work. Don't cover the uh, trenches until you have completed the job. Okay, I'm not making this tight yet, just in case I need to move it. I'll tighten it right at the end. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to drill the other holes using a spirit level, making sure that I can get these clamps on straight. And just a reminder, you could use something like that and another bend there. Um, but as I said, this is where the spray comes in handy. All right, so I'm just using nylon wall plugs because this is a brick. So what you do is you just uh, drill it in and then uh, you use your screws. And just make sure the wall plug is all the way in before you screw it in. And make sure you, this is now in the correct position in terms of the height and where it is on the ground. And I'm satisfied with this so I can now tighten it. Alright, so there you can see the wire going in the conduit along the pillar. That wire has come from the DB board. Remember we ran it along the, the uh, gum poles using the saddles. And here you can see the three brackets. And then that's how it is run on the floor, keeping in mind that the floor part will be buried once the installation is complete. Right, now I'm going to go to the first join and I'm going to show you how to couple the conduits and run the wire to where the light would be. Right, now this is the remainder of the cable that is going to be running along the wall. So you need to get the end of the cable, make sure there's no knots. I do not have knots here, although it does look like it's knotted, it's not. And what I need to do is I need to thread this through this coupler. Remember that I'm going to tee off here to a floodlight. So there's going to be a join. And I'll show you how to do that shortly. But what you want to do is you want to thread it. And I have the other trunk uh, conduit. And then you don't want this so so tight. So what you're going to do is you're going to pull it back a bit and do that. So that's enough to make a join because we are going to join that way. So what we'll end up doing is that will go in there and I'll run a cable from there to here and I will put a three-way join here, a terminal block, or you can crimp it. But remember to do that, otherwise you'll have too little cable. All right, so here you can see I've cut a length of wire. I'm going to now join it at the... Uh, coupling point right so the wire has to be in the conduit for this tee off if you find this is a bit stuck it won't get in there just wet it <clears throat> and now what I need to do is join all these three wires together so I'm just going to strip this one
Right, so all you need to do is all the blacks, all the neutrals go together, all the reds, the lives go together, and all the earths go together. There are various ways to do it, just check the standards in your country. I'm just going to use a terminal block, which looks like that. And basically, you thread the wires in there, and then you tighten it with these screws. These are not the best, they tend to corrode after a while. Um, I, the better way to do it is to crimp it, but I'm just going to use the terminal block for now. Right, when you do strip this, make sure you do not gouge the uh, copper. You don't want to make any incisions into the copper. Basically, I'm just embedding the uh, side cutter into the uh, jacket, but it does not get to the copper. Then I'm pulling it. So I'm actually not cutting any of the copper at all. I'm really just almost tearing it is a better word. Otherwise, use wire strippers, which is the best bet. Now, please note, some people may be more comfortable using armored cable. Some people will prefer to use uh, steel conduit. And uh, personally, this will be put in cement in my insulation. So I'm not so worried about that. But it really depends on the different sites. So just uh, consult your local authority in terms of the standards or the relevant electrical standards to comply. You don't want somebody coming later with a spade uh, or a fork and doing the garden and piercing right through the plastic conduit. Make sure that your work is earth and protected by an earth leakage circuit breaker. All right, so the first tee off is done and the floodlight is going to go about here. We're going to put some cement and put some bricks, which I'll show you shortly. We've run the conduit in the remainder of the trench and the piece of conduit was a bit short, so we've just joined it here. And there's the next tee off. Right, there you can see the coupling at the back and here is the conduit and I'm going to have the light somewhere here. So all I have to do now is cut a piece of wire so that it joins to that point at the back there. Right, for this one I wanted to show you another method and that is the crimping method. Now these are ferrules and you put it around the wire like that and then you can actually crimp it. Right, now if you look on the other side you'll see the crimp. There they are and that forces it closed tightly. Okay, there's the first tee off and we're going to position the floodlight just about here. So what we've done is we've 
dugout so that we can put the floodlight and also it will be in a um, almost on a platform so plants won't grow on it and that it, if, you, if somebody uh, walks in the bushes here they won't just destroy the floodlight all right so i'm just using an led this is a 10 watt so it's quite small and what will happen is the light will sit like that and uh, this needs to be able to be screwed into something and that is why I'm going to show you shortly we've got concrete and bricks. The only thing is we need this wire to be wired here nicely into the concrete so that it's there as a fixture. Right, so now this is going to be installed into the brick so that uh, it's strong and that if you need to change it you can. But unfortunately they come with these very short wires so that means that this housing has to be very close. But, you know, if it's on the brick, it's a bit of an eyesore. So maybe you want to put it on the side. Um, you could also use a little box like this and just have a little box here. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the um, sprag to about here. Now I'm going to use a one-way housing and I'm going to uh, press that out. And I'm going to have the spray coming in from the concrete. So all that's going to be needed is that going into that. The uh, electrical supply wire is going to be waiting there. So I'm just going to press this through. But as I said, there's many ways to do this. This is what it looks like. So we're going to put concrete here. This is going to be in the concrete and we're only going to have this coming out. The brick is going to be in the concrete and then what's going to happen is the, the floodlight can just be wired directly into this housing. On the other side, we are going to follow a slightly different method. We are using, uh, we are not using Sprag. We are now using a 90 degree bend. Uh, it does have the inspection side, but it's just because I ran out of uh, stock with the normal one. So don't worry about why there's screws on the side there. You can't inspect it because it's going to be in concrete anyway. And then we're going to do a similar setup in terms of the concrete over it. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to put the concrete here. The brick is going to be there, it's going to be hiding the uh, enclosure there, and this is going to feed straight into that, like so.
Right, so now I've come back two days later. This concrete is dry enough to carry on working. Uh, just keep in mind that concrete does take quite a long time to dry. But as you can see, uh, as you can hear, um, this concrete is dry enough to continue. Right, so the way it's going to look is I'm going to put this gland in there, which I'll do shortly, and then this is going to be fed like that so there's the little light and i'm going to drill into the brick now the reason why i'm drilling into the brick is i want to put a plug in there uh, and there's a screw and a washer so that that will go in the center there and i can turn this the way i want so i'm just using one screw now you might say why not just put it straight into the concrete that's also fine but then keeping in mind that the concrete's not as nice looking where's the brick this is a face brick uh, shortly when we cover this with soil you'll just see this brick it doesn't look bad it kind of matches the soil whereas the concrete uh, it doesn't look uh, aesthetically pleasing so gently drill into the brick. We don't want to crack the brick. Okay, and as you can see, that goes through there. And that will be like that. I'm not going to tighten it yet because I still have to wire up the floodlight. I'm just using a gland. There you can see is the a rubber grommet. And that goes through there. Ferals are better, although ferals are better, because lights go um, offline, they, they, the bulbs break or the LED uh, circuit breaks, you, this is something you'll change maybe every year or two, so therefore ferals you'll have to cut them, whereas this you can just unscrew and then add your new, change your light. This is not a requirement, but I just put some silicone here because ultimately you're not going to change this wire ever. Uh, so sometimes water can get in here. And the reason why is firstly, you know, somebody might change this and then not close it properly. Or it might uh, be, you know, a gardener might smack it with a, with a spade or whatever it is. So I'm just uh, putting a... I'm just putting a blob of silicone there so water can't go in there because what often happens is water gets into the conduit and it actually breaks down the insulation and that's when you have the earth trips. Okay, live is brown, earth is the green to the copper and then the blue and the black, those are the neutral. Right, now I just put the lid on. Okay, so you can see the one screw allowing you to rotate it. And now can just align this to however you want it to shine in the plants. So it's going to sit like that. And now you can cover this uh, concrete with your sand. Right, so this is the other side. I'm going to follow a similar procedure. Here's the light. It's going to be facing up this way. And there is the, there is the enclosure where I'm going to be inserting the wire.
All right, so you've seen me install two of the lights. The third one I installed on a tree. I'm not gonna show you the detailed steps because it's not something you should be doing. So I'm just gonna skip ahead and show you the wiring into the DB board, which is the next part of the video. Right, so the garden lights are now wired. The only thing is to give them a supply, meaning connected to the supply. Now, if you are going to be connecting yours just via a plug socket like this, well, then that's the easiest because in terms of complying with the rules, uh, they're, they're much more relaxed because you're plugging in. If you are going to be wiring it directly into a DB board, then you must comply with the local standards in terms of how you do the electrical wiring. All right, so just make sure that uh, you see that this must be off. Uh, you can trip it like that. Um, it's a good idea if you could go and switch off your main breaker. Don't work on uh, electrical circuits while they're on. Okay, so this has to be wired into here. Um, you need a gland, that's the gland. It's a panel mount gland, as you can see. It's got a little nut there, and I have to break a hole there, put that there, and thread it in just like the other ones have been done. Keeping in mind that there is power there. Go and switch off your mains now. Right, I've just cleaned up the DB board a little bit. It was a bit of a mess. And what I want to bring to your attention is that even though these are all down like that, you've got to be careful of the infeed. Now, this is the infeed. I'm just using a multimeter and I'm just going to measure that. And as you can see, uh, 233 volts sitting over here. Now, why that's important is even though you've switched everything off don't assume there isn't live voltage there's live voltage sitting right there and there so be careful when you're working on a db board my advice is go and switch off the mains coming in to your office or wherever this db board is situated this is a secondary board and you've probably got a main board sitting upstream the board that feeds this particular board so what you've got to do is go to that board and disconnect that board, which means these two terminals will go offline. Right, before I show you how to connect up your garden lights, I just want to just uh, describe a few uh, features here. The first one is, as you look at these wires, this is 1.5 millimeter, which means it can only carry a maximum current of about 16 amps, which means your circuit breaker has to be matched to the conductor. You, you cannot put a this wire onto a 20 amp circuit breaker for example because the wire will burn out before the circuit breaker trips so a 10 amp is fine because if for example somebody shorts out the light at in the garden what will happen is the wire won't burn but the circuit breaker will trip and that's what's supposed to happen so please make sure you match the wire to the current rating of the circuit breaker or the other way around as long as the circuit breaker is tripping at a lower amperage as your wire okay the next thing you'll see is this has earth leakage now that means that it's looking at the differential if you look there is a live wire and there's a neutral the neutral is denoted by the black color if there's a differential meaning the current coming in and the current going out are different then the earth leakage will trip so that's there to protect human life. So do not bypass that. Make sure that that is still in place. Now what I've done is I've got a little 10 amp circuit breaker. And as you can see, this is called a DIN rail. And I would like to install it. And this will be for my 
little floodlights that I've just installed. So there's going to be my floodlights. Now, keeping in mind, the way the person has done this by jumpering, putting a jumper across is actually incorrect. You should use a copper bar like that. And you normally buy it in a long length and you cut it and you insert it there. If you haven't got bus bar like that, it's fine. You can jumper it, but I'm going to show you the correct method of jumpering it. Now, before I do that, I just want to show you one more thing. Live and neutral coming in through the earth leakage. So these wires here are what is actually feeding or powering up the circuit breakers in this little DB board. Can you see that it comes in there live, goes out, there we go. And then it's supposed to feed the top rail of all these circuit breakers. So all of these are going to share the same power wire. Now you might be wondering, this power, this power cable here is actually quite thin. Because this here says 63 amps. So it should be something more like that. This is only a 10 millimeter, which is actually a 40 amp. But it should be a 16 millimeter, which will give you your 60 odd amps. Now, if you're wondering why this cable is so thin, yet it says 63 amps, it's because the the upstream DB board that is feeding this will trip out at 20 amps. Therefore, the person who wired this is not incorrect at putting a 20 amp cable here because even though this is a 63 amp uh, earth leakage, it'll still work at low current. Ideally, you should have a isolator switch here at the rating of this cable. There should be another circuit breaker here at 20 amps. Okay, so now the reason why this type of setup is incorrect is because if you have a look at it, this daisy chaining, see that's a daisy chain. That is incorrect because what you're assuming is that if I pull 10 amps, it's pulling it from this wire. Now what happens if this circuit breaker is also feeding its 10 amps, so that's 10 plus 10 is already 20 and you've already exceeded the current carrying capacity of the wire. So daisy chaining it is incorrect. What you should supposed to do is feed all of them from the incoming line. So what we need to do is actually put a longer conductor. So something like that is better. In your case, it'll probably look something like this. Now this will be able to carry all the loads. So as you can see, this wire here will then meet with the main incoming power cable or maybe it was a bus bar then that would be ideal because it will just be running across all the circuit breakers so the point i'm trying to make is do not just buddy it or jump it to the very nearby circuit breaker please go directly to the circuit breaker where the in feed is coming in right so you want it to look like that and just make sure they're all in and fastened Right, so how do you wire up the floodlights? Okay, so this is the live and neutral coming in from those garden lights. So all you need to do is connect the live to the output of the circuit breaker. So the circuit breaker is down, there's no continuity. So there I've wired the live to the bottom of the circuit breaker. And just so you understand how that works, I'll just show you in terms of continuity. This is measuring a short circuit, and if you have a look across the circuit breaker, you can see that there's no short circuit. But when I switch it on, you can hear continuity, which means that when it's down, it breaks the circuit, and when it's up, it allows current to flow, which means current coming into the DB board through the earth leakage, feeding the main rail here at the top, puts the voltage there waiting to power up your light so now it is in the on position but obviously it still won't work because the earth leakage is down because we first need to connect your neutral a neutral you just connect to an available spot on your neutral rail which i'm doing like this if your db board has multiple neutral rails please make sure that the neutral rail the neutral bar that you're connecting it to is the one that is the out coming from the output of that mains earth leakage right so if i test it I need to close the earth leakage and there you can see the voltage 231 circuit breaker is up the lights should be on and there you can see the flood light is on all three of them are on so that's showing me that the wiring is correct right so as you can see the power is on and if you trip your circuit breaker there you've switched off your flood lights now maybe you want to put it on a timer so that is the very last thing i'll just quickly demonstrate how to put your flood lights on a timer now you can get a variety of timers 
Uh, this particular one uh, is made by a company called uh, CVI. There we go. And this is a nice one because it's got touch screen and things like that. And then if you want something like this, this is a different manufacturer. And this one is nice because you can adjust the day. Each particular day could have a different timing sequence. So you could have a Monday, it does a certain thing. Tuesday, a certain thing. Maybe you don't want your garden lights on during the week. Or well, then you would use something like this. This is a normal DIN rail. But this one, if you want every day the same program, you could use something like this. All right, so I'm going to set it up with this particular timer. This is a DIN rail timer. It still needs a circuit breaker. You can't just say, well, because I've got a timer, there's no circuit breaker. You still got to use the circuit breaker. So now, instead of going from the circuit breaker to the light, you're going to go from the circuit breaker to the timer. So make sure it's off. Now, the first thing you got to do with this timer is give it a supply current. Okay, so even though it's AC, there is an AC connection here. And while AC is unidirectional, in terms of this timer, it does specify that the live and neutral have specific positions. So the neutral is on pin number two. And there it is, point two, terminal two is the neutral. Now I have a neutral rail right here, so I can connect it directly to my neutral bar. <coughs> Right now, once again, the timer also needs power. You know, the timer has got a little digital circuit there. So it needs a supply point for the digital circuit to work. So this is going to be the pin one and that's going to be connected to the main live. Now the output of the timer goes to pin number five and I'll just show you where I'm getting this from. You can see on the wiring diagram there it shows number five to your appliance. So this happens to be a lamp. Well same in my circuit which is floodlights. But then there's one thing missing is that the live coming in to feed the lamp with this happens to be a normally open switch there you can see so pin number four there we go the live coming in when the timer activates will short out to pin number five allowing the live current to flow via four to five so there you can see number five i've just put number five in there the conductor so now i just need to install number four and then you can see when the timer activates pin number four and five actually short out so four goes to five so allowing the current to flow so there we go from the output of the circuit breaker to the input of the timer when the timer activates it will short out those pins effectively connecting this directly to the end of the circuit breaker meaning current will flow to the light like that Okay, I suggest you close your DB board now because everything's wired up. Now, if yours is brand new, you probably will not have to reset it, but I'll just show you there are some programs already set here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just reset the whole timer by pressing this button there and holding it in and then releasing. Now it defaults the timer and you're ready to go to set this up. In order to set the clock, you can see it says C plus and then it says W plus H plus M plus. You see the pluses go together, so I press the, and hold the C button and I choose the day of the week. And you see the top there, it is going Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Right, today is Tuesday, so I'm going to leave it on Tuesday. Now, if I want to set the hour, I press the C button and the hour button together. Now, the time now is just after 6 o'clock, so I'm going to set it to 1800. Now, the minutes, it's 606, so I'll just press and hold the minute button with the C plus button. If you do not like the military time function, the, you see it says 1800, maybe you want it to be 6 o'clock, you press and hold the C button with the clock button. Can you see it changes it to PM versus military time 1800. Right, the next step is to set the timing sequences. Now what you'll do is you'll press the timer button. Now I'll just toggle through this. I just want to show you that it says one and on. Can you see then it says one and off, two and on, two and off, three on, three off, and it goes up to eight. So this means you have eight individual programs which you can set on this timer. They have nothing to do with each other and they work independent. Right, so let's set one timer. Now it's asking you for the on time. Now first tell it the day you can see that it's giving you the first day which because today is tuesday it starts at tuesday but maybe you want the timer to only come on on a wednesday or a thursday or a friday or a saturday sunday 
or the whole week, Monday to Sunday, or just the work week, or just the weekends. Maybe it's garden lights only on the weekend. Maybe you're there you see it's some security device only from Monday to Saturday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, every second day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. All right, so you can see you get a lot of variety here. So I'm just going to set it for every day. If you want the timer to come on every day and follow the same sequence for every day. There we go. Right now, what time do you want the timer to come on? I'm going to set this to 1808. Now, there you can see 1800 and 08. Well, let's make it 1810. Right, now what time do you want it to go off? So I'm going to press the timer button. You can see it's got like a timer there. And the off time, I also want it to be all the days. For example, if you only set it to a Wednesday, it's going to be on every day. But Wednesday is the only day it's going to go off. So because I set it for every day on, I must also set it for every day off. Now what time? I can press and hold and you can see it scrolls through quite quickly. So let's go to 18 and let's make this 10. That's the time it went on. Let's make it 11. So it's actually only on for one minute. All right, so let's review the setting. One. On 18.10 or 6.10 every day. And what time does it go off? 18.11 every day. Right, so let's watch it in action. To get back to the main menu, you can just wait a few seconds. There you can see it's 6.09. As soon as it goes to 6.10, this LED will come on and you'll hear the click activating the relay, closing the circuit. Right, so there you can see it clicked on and at 6.11, it will click off. Right, what I want to bring to attention, see it says auto. If you want to override the timer and it's on but you can't... And you, but you want to switch it off, I can manually switch it off. It'll stay off now. If you want to get it back on, you can see it's auto. The next time it comes to this timing sequence of 610, it'll come on. If I want to make it on, or irrespective, it is now on irrespective of the timing sequence. Now I've put it back to auto. Now at 611, it will go off. There we go. You can see how it went off. If you want to override it, as I said, you can just press on. Now, irrespective of whether the timer was set to be on or off, it will just stay on. If you want to switch it off, it's fine. You just press off, but that will stay off. Right, I'm going to do one more setting. I'm going to go to program number two. Can you see one is already done? Off for one is already done. On for two is not done so i want to set this for a let's make it a saturday 1 30 that's fine and what time is it going to go off i must press the timer button again for the off time now keep in mind that was a saturday if i put this on a sunday it's going to stay on till two o'clock in the morning on sunday so just be aware of the day that it says there because if you make a mistake it will wait till the next day to go off right and that is set if you have made a mistake just press the reset button the reset for the timing button so if you want to correct that and make that for just a saturday it's fine you just press this several times until you get to the saturday and there you go you can adjust your timing sequence okay so having a review of the timers let's have a look these are the different programs uh, that was number one six ten off time 611 I just use that for an example was on for one minute the next one is on on a Saturday at 1 30 but goes off at 2 o'clock right if you want to clear it it's fine you just press the clear button then if you want to clear all the timing sequences it's fine you just go from the beginning and you'll say clear next one clear next one clear and the rest are cleared so that is how you clear the programming now you can go ahead and reprogram your timings okay so there is the finished product you can see how the brick is in the concrete the sand is covering it uh, it's much better option than these uh, push in lights you see these ones you you hit into the ground and as you can see they tend to uh, get destroyed and they're plastic uh, these are quite uh, nice in terms of do it yourself but this is your long-term solution here you go when this floodlight is damaged or it's uh, the globe is broken no problem you unscrew that and you change it you just open here to get to the gland 
Right, so there you can see the final photos, the night view of these floodlights in the uh, garden bed. I did the three lights. I showed the two. The one is on the tree. Uh, you could put it on the floor. I don't recommend installing things on trees, but uh, nevertheless, I did do that. So what I want to bring to your attention is one last thing. When you're earthing your system, please make sure you do run the earth cable the earth lead into your db board and connect it to the available earths at that point if you do look at the db board you'll see all the earths tied together all right so thanks for watching this very detailed video cheers